and I want to welcome you back to Grace Church for the first gathering that we've had together of everyone from both services under one roof. What a blessing it is today to be able to worship the Lord together. And afterward, we do have a meal that's already pretty much prepared, and I think burgers have to go on the grill, but there's a meal prepared afterward, so if you are able, please stay after today. There are a lot of announcements in today's bulletin. I want to ask you just to turn there, and I'll point out a couple things quickly. If you are on the missions trip, the Quest missions trip, we're asking that you would come tonight for your meeting at 6 p.m. Michael is not here this morning to announce that. In fact, Michael is up at North Scott Church, and he is filling the pulpit up there at their 1030 service today. So we might see him afterward at the food time, he said, but not going to see him during the service here. So, but, but Michael is in town, and we will have that meeting tonight. There's also a sign-up for the serving teams. We're kicking back into serving teams again after we've not had those sign-ups uh, going around now for over a year. And uh, so there's a sign-up. We decided rather than pass it, which is the very best way to get people's names on there, we had to put it in the back. And so we want to ask you to try to remember that after church and sign up for a month for serving teams. There's not going to be a lot of things that we're doing necessarily on serving teams, but we are wanting to man those positions so that we can serve in a more organized way from here on. Now, let's see, there's a couple of other things I want to mention that are not on the back page, although there is a Bible study, a men's Bible study, this Thursday night at 7 o'clock. I don't think that made it on the calendar this, this week, but we're going to be studying the book of Habakkuk, which is just a, maybe a three-chapter minor prophet. And if you're interested in coming for that, read Habakkuk in preparation for that men's Bible study on Thursday night. And then, uh, let's see, I wanted to just say a special word of thanks to a, quite a number of people, kind of several classes of people, but these are folks who have actually been serving here at Grace Church kind of double duty, and we can immediately look over and think of all of the accompanists who have been serving at the early service and the late service. I'm glad that that's over, but I just want to say thank you to those who have served in that capacity or on the worship team in both services and uh, also the sound um, and the video production folks who have been coming oftentimes for both and for spouses who actually have been coming for both and people who've been coming to the early service so that they can get to the um, uh, kitchen and serve after the early service the meal that we've been putting together. So there's just quite a group of people there who are serving publicly or just serving quietly in an unnoticed way. And I just want to say thank you personally to those folks who have been doing those double duties. And then I also want to just encourage you, when you see people who you know have been doing double duties like that, also say a personal word of thanks to them. I was talking to some pastor in the last week or uh, hearing about a church where maybe even uh, the pastor is getting himself in a little bit of trouble perhaps for asking his people to do things. And uh, I remember just thinking at the time, wow, I hardly ever have to ask people to do things. People volunteer to do things. People just find their way. And I look over and I realize, wow, they're doing that. They're doing that. And we have a, a richness here of, of just an attitude of serving the Lord. Thank you. Thank you. That's what a church should be. And then uh, also uh, just... Uh, um, a word on the giving drive that we've had for the Portage uh, Pregnancy Resource Center. Um, we've done that for several weeks now, and the monies have all come in and been measured, at least up to this point. If you bring in more, it will just add to that. But the amount that came in is $1,076 and change. Isn't that an amazing thing? That's a, quite a lot to be giving to a local organization. And thank you for those of you who have... Uh, participated in that. Also, I just want to turn your attention back to the prayer page. So if you back up one page, there's a couple things on there and a couple things to add. Um, I understand that uh, uh, Bear Neef has gotten back from his knee surgery, and at least initially, an excellent report. Um, the next day, Bear walked to the barn and back, and um, I think in a long time, Bear has never walked to the barn. <laughs> so that is a huge plus. Of course, the first day or two, 
you're not sure how it will go after that necessarily. But continue to pray for Judd Bear. And uh, Judy Barden had her heart valve surgery this week, and Lee will go in for his back surgery on July 1st. So I want, we want you to just keep those names in front of you that you would continue to pray. Continue to pray for our summer youth group and add to that um, Sky Lodge Camp. And we have quite a few folks who are on break from Sky Lodge Camp. And it's nice to see some faces that we haven't quite seen as much this summer. We want to welcome you back to, from Sky Lodge. And what else do we have here? Um, put on the list also to pray for Vacation Bible School, which uh, we now have some plans for. And if you'll turn back yet another page into the bulletin, there's actually a full page announcement about Vacation Bible School. I just want to talk to you about this a little bit. We're doing things a little differently. We're doing things a lot differently this year for Vacation Bible School. We were thinking when we got together, wow, early in this year, if not the end of last year, what can we do? What should we be thinking of for Vacation Bible School this year? Last year, because of the COVID, we did it all outdoors. And we thought, that will be tough. But it wasn't that tough. And it went well. And by the way, the Lord gave us good weather. And it worked out quite well. And so we were thinking, well, what are we going to do this year? Are we going to do it outside? We could do it outside. Should we plan to do it outside? And somehow in the planning, in the discussion, we, we were talking about these things. We realized, you know what? About 95% of the kids who come are church kids from Grace Church and some others from a couple of other local churches, mostly North Scott. And uh, the number of kids that we're reaching in our community is very small, actually, if maybe not at all. So we began thinking, well, what can we do to reach out more toward our community? And the idea came, if we did VBS last year on our own premises, outdoors, could we do it in the park in town? And that we thought, it's going to take more energy to do that because there will be daily setups instead of just once a week setups and takes downs. But we began to think, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could do this in town and then kids could even just walk to vacation Bible school who might otherwise not have a ride or any other means to get there. So that's the direction actually that we're going with vacation Bible school this year. And that's going to mean that there's going to have to be a different kind of a rank of folks that are needed this year to be able to come in and do the setups and the takedowns before and after each day. So this is an opportunity for folks who might not be saying, you know what, yeah, I really connect well with kids. Yes, I really want to lead around my little cluster of kids. I want to teach kids or something like that. This is an opportunity to serve where you're coming ahead of time and putting things up and then coming afterward and taking things down. And it's an opportunity to serve the community. And we, our hope is that this year's Vacation Bible School will be a wider opportunity to actually reach out to people who are outside of the Christian community and to minister to our own community. So this year, instead of calling it Grace Churches, Grace Presbyterian Churches Vacation Bible School, we're also calling it Partyville Community Vacation Bible School. Partyville Community Vacation Bible School. We are going to need some help the list of some of the new jobs and other jobs that we need to have filled for Vacation Bible School are written in here, and Renee would be liking to hear from you if you're thinking, yeah, maybe I could fill in this, maybe I could do that, or what could I do? Talk to Renee, and she's certainly available to do that today. There's also on that announcement, I think it says that it's scheduled for the 17th to the 21st, and that would be starting on a Tuesday. It's a misprint, apparently, and it should be the 16th. So that is, just as usual, it's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. It's five days of that week in August. So one last announcement, and that is that this coming week, is the General Assembly meeting of the, of the Presbyterian Church in America. So our denomination has its annual meeting, and it meets this week, I think from about Tuesday evening to Friday morning. 
And so we just want to ask you, that did not get into the prayer page, but we're going to ask you to add that to the prayer page. Just be praying for the decisions and the reports that are coming denominationally, and that's an opportunity for us to gather together and to have harmony or to gather together and work out details of things that, uh, that need to be worked out, to make plans and set vision for the future. We ask your prayers for that, as well as just the general harmony and peace of the church. What else is there? Any other announcements that we need to make before we go on? Donna. What time was vacation Bible school? AM? It's in the AM. I think it will probably be 9 to noon, noon, something like that. 9 to noon. That's the usual time anyway. 9 to noon. What else? What else? Yes. Uh, Give an update on Steve. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you for that reminder. We, we, uh, Steve and Judy Killian are back in the hospital. And uh, actually, so they've been out for 26 days. So that's a long time. They've been out of the hospital the longest yet. And Steve was, at, was coming back in. He was breathing. <sighs> Something like that. I didn't see it, but that's the way it was reported to me. And so they took him in and they have not found, last I knew, what the source of that was. Um, but just being in there, there are several things that have happened. One is that they've checked his heart, and his heart function is actually working better than it had been, and so they're thankful for that. There's no fl- fluid building up in his lungs. They checked that. That's also good. The wound nurse saw his wound for the first time in uh, a month or more, and she said, wow, that's really doing better. So previously, it was about... Uh, it was about, I think she said seven centimeters, which must be something like three inches in around, right? And now it's between uh, three and four centimeters. Three centimeters in one direction, maybe four in another. So there's some healing going on that maybe you don't recognize from day to day. But that's also uh, something to be very thankful for. And there's a long ways more to go with that. And uh, what else is there? So we still don't know the answer to why Steve's breathing is off so far as I know and continue to pray in regard to that. Did I see another hand over here? Yes, Gail. <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> okay, I'll give you time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Well, with that said, we're going to have our call to worship. And rather than read that from the bulletin responsively, I'm going to read it from Ephesians chapter 1. So if you have your Bible, I want to ask you to open up your Bible. And we're going to read our call to worship from there rather than what I had printed in the bulletin. And what we're looking at here is our God who is a fountain of every blessing. So this is connecting really to the first song that we're going to sing, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. And we're seeing some of the many, some of the myriads of blessings that God is giving to us. And by the way, I'm going to say one more thing by by announcement. I see that Luke Spicer is here in the back of the church, and I just want to point that out to you. (laughs) Glory to God. Glad to see you, Luke. Good to have you here. Let's read God's call to worship here. The reasons that we have to be thankful for here from from, uh, the first chapter of Ephesians. I'm beginning in verse 3 if you're following along. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. So count your blessings. I'm sorry there aren't enough numbers. He has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ, in the heavenly places. Have you received it yet? Yet 
Yes. Have you received it yet? No. There are many blessings that are yet to come in Christ. He has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he, going back to the beginning, chose us in Christ before the foundations of the world. Really, God was thinking about us from before the foundations of the world. He chose us in him before the foundations of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. That's going to take some work. God is going to do that work. Middle of verse 4. In him, that is in Christ, he predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his purpose and goodwill. God has called you, blood-bought saint, into fellowship with him, not at a distance, not into a community town meeting, but into the very family of God. You are a child of God through Jesus Christ. Picking up in verse 6, to the praise of his glorious grace with which he has blessed us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood. That's done. Forgiveness of our trespasses. That's done in accordance with the riches of his grace. Verse 11. In him we have obtained an inheritance. And what a glorious inheritance. The inheritance that is due to Jesus Christ for his obedience and his righteousness has been counted to us. In him we have obtained an inheritance, having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works out all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we would be the first, so that we who are the first to hope in Christ might be for the praise of his glory. And he's done all of this for us in love, not in some algorithm of predestination, but in personal, divine, eternal love. Father in heaven, we thank you as we read these things and are encouraged and exhorted in these things. We thank you for your having been for us the fountain of every blessing. What an encouragement it is to recognize, though we don't always see it every day, that you have blessed us and that you do bless us and that you will bless us and that your blessings never cease according to the riches of your grace. Now, Lord, as we stand and worship you, we ask that, in fact, that you would arouse that kind of delight in us to praise you and to worship you as the great giver, the great fountain, the great lover of your people. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I don't know how many of you have been walking around the last couple of weeks looking at your uh, brown lawns or yep. the crops that have been rolling and not healthy. And then you see the first few drops of rain hit, and they kind of hit. I was mowing lawn because I looked like it was going to rain, and I'm like, okay, I'm going to mow. Well, this might be a good time. Those first drops of rain hit, and there's a poof of dust. <laughs> and it just barely, it doesn't even do anything. And I just thought, man, that's... If God's grace was just one drop coming down, what would it do for us? It wouldn't do hardly anything. And yet God's grace rains down on us, just like we've had rain the last few days, and it just saturates everything. It just saturates us completely and covers everything completely. And uh, I just thought it was kind of a cool way to look at, at what God's grace can do for us and how it, it just absolutely saturates us. It just, he just doesn't send one little bit of grace down from one little time in your life. He just rains it down on you through your whole life. So just think on that a little bit as we sing together, as we worship together. Would you please stand and let's sing, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing Turn my heart to sing thy grace Ceasing, song of songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious song, and song by flame. 
but to each one of us. Oh, sorry. As a prisoner for the Lord, then, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling you have received. Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love, making every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, and just as you were called to one hope when you were called, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. do this next song in a round, men, if you follow me, we're going to start it off. Lord Jesus, so worthy is your name. And we love to praise you. We love to sing to you. And Lord, we just pray that you receive all the honor and all the glory today. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that in your word we can read about your promises to us. Your promise, Lord, to send a Savior down to earth, a baby, a man to walk among us a man innocent in every single way, a man to hang on a cross, a man whose blood was shed for each and every person here, Lord Jesus, and an amazing plan to save us from ourselves and our sin and our deceit and our lies and our hatred Lord, every sin is covered. Lord, we'd just like to take some time to silently confess our sins to you this morning.
Lord Jesus, we thank you for your grace. Your grace that is not just one drop on the dry ground, Lord, but it rains down and it saturates us. And it turns our souls from dry and dusty and dead, withered grass to green, lush blades once again, Lord Jesus. Lord, we just ask that you would hear our prayers, hear our confessions to you this morning, Lord Jesus. We thank you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hear this affirmation of God's grace. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. God, to confess our sins, I ran across a quote by John Chrysostom, uh, who was one of the early church fathers back in about 400 AD. He says, be ashamed when you sin, don't be ashamed when you repent. Sin is the wound of repentance. Sin is the wound and repentance is the medicine. Let's go before our Father in prayer. Father, we just thank you for your blessings that are poured out upon us. Father, each and every day, and Father, we just would thank you for this opportunity and the freedoms we have, this freedom to gather here together, how wonderful it is to see a church full of Nicole gather back together again, sing praises to you and to worship you. Father, we would just ask that you be with those who are sick and hurting, we think especially of Steve at this time, Father, that the doctors would be able to find out what's causing his breathing problems, bring, bring healing to him, Father. And Father, we ask your blessing as well on the rest of this day uh, as we each go our separate ways. Be with Pastor Chuck now as he brings your message to us. May it speak to our hearts. And we just ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> but to each one of us, grace has been given, as Christ apportioned it. This is why it says, when he ascended on high, he led captives in his train and gave gifts to men. What does he ascend mean, except that he also descended to the lower earthly regions? He who descended is the very one who ascended higher than all the heavens in order to fill the whole universe. It was he who gave to some the ability to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining the whole measure of the fullness of Christ.
to ask you to open your Bibles and turn to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 2 this morning. We are experiencing a little bit of technical difficulties. Maybe you've noticed that in terms of the sound, but it's our understanding that we have one speaker on this side that's working and one speaker, this monitor that we can set up here to broadcast forward. But uh, if you need to move around a little bit to get in a better place to hear, please go ahead and do that. And I'll try to keep my voice uh, at the peak as well. And uh, we'll pray for the best. So we're reading this morning from 1 first, uh, from first Samuel chapter 2. And I'm picking up in verse 11. And I'm aware that I'm reading a, a lengthy passage this morning. I'm actually reading the better part of one chapter and in and the whole of another. And so I want to ask you, if you have your Bible, certainly you will track better with this if we actually just read along together. So follow along with me in your Bible, if you will. We're picking up this week after last week, we looked at the wonderful story of the way that God brought about the birth of Samuel from this barren woman, Hannah, and this week we're looking beyond the deliverance of that woman from those very bitter times and bitter circumstances. Now we're looking at what God was doing and beginning to do in bringing Samuel into this world. And so follow along with me. We read, we'll begin in chapter 2 and verse 11. This is God's word. Then Elkanah went home to Ramon, Ramah. And the boy, that is Samuel, was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli, the priest. Now the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. Realize what's being said there. The sons of Eli, the priest, were, who were also priests, were worthless men, and they did not know the Lord. The custom of the priests with the people was that when any man offered a sacrifice, the priest's servant would come, and while the meat was boiling, 
With a three-pronged fork in his hand, he would thrust it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. And all that the Lord brought up, the priest would take for himself. This is what they did at Shiloh to all the Israelites who came there. Moreover, before the fat was burned, and by the way, the fat portions of the offerings were to be burnt before God. Those particularly were for God. That was the sacrifice. That was the meat that was to be sacrificed, the fatty portions. So um, in verse 15, moreover, before the fat was burned, the priest, the priest servant would come and say to the man who was sacrificing, give me for the priest to roast. For he will not accept boiled meat from you, but only raw. And if the man said, but let him first burn the fat first. Let him burn the fat first and then take as much as you wish. The servant would say, no, you give it now. And if you don't, I'll take it by force. And thus the sin of the young men, that is Eli's sons, thus the sin of the young men was very great in the sight of the Lord. For the men treated the offerings of the Lord with contempt. But Samuel was ministering before the Lord. And a boy clothed with a boy clothed in a linen ephod. His mother used to make it for him a little robe and take it to him each year when she went up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. Then Eli would bless Elkanah and his wife and say, and may the Lord give you children by this woman for the petition that she asked of the Lord. So then they would return to their home. And indeed, the Lord visited Hannah and she conceived and she bore three sons and two daughters, and the boy Samuel grew in the presence of the Lord. Now Eli was very old, and he kept hearing all that his sons were doing to all Israel, and how they lay with the women who were serving at the entrance to the tent of meeting. And he said to them, Why do you do such things? For I hear your evil dealings from these people. No, my sons, it is no good report that I hear the people of the Lord spreading abroad. If someone sins against a man, God will mediate for him. But if someone sins against the Lord, who can intercede for him? But they would not listen to the voice of their father, for it was the will of the Lord to put them to death. Now the boy Samuel continued to grow in stature and in favor with the Lord and also with man. Verse 27, there came a man of God to Eli and said to him, thus says the Lord, did I reveal myself to the house of your father when they were in Egypt? Subject to the house of Pharaoh, and did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest and to go up to my altar and to burn incense and to wear the ephod before me? I gave the house of your father all the offerings by fire from the people of Israel. Why do you scorn my sacrifices and my offerings I commanded for my dwelling? And honor your sons above me by fattening yourselves on the choicest parts of every offering of my people Israel. Therefore, the Lord, the God of Israel declares, I promised that your house and the house of your father should go in and should go in and out before me forever. But now, declares the Lord, far be it from me for those who honor me, I will honor and those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Behold, the days are coming when I will cut off your strength and the strength of your father's house so that there will not be an old man in your house. Then in distress, you will look with envious eye on the prosperity that shall be bestowed upon Israel and there not, shall not be an old man in your house forever." 
only one of you whom I shall not cut off from my altar shall be spared to weep his eyes out and grieve his heart and all the descendants of your house, Eli, all the descendants of your house shall die by the sword of men. And this shall come upon your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. They shall be assigned to you. Both of them shall die on the same day. And I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who shall do according to what is in my heart and in my mind. And I will build him a sure house. And he will go out and he in and out before my anointed forever. And everyone who is left in your house shall come and implore him for a piece of silver or a loaf of bread and shall say, please put in one of the put me in one of the priest's places that I may have a morsel of bread to eat. Chapter three. Now, the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord in the presence of Eli and the word of the Lord was rare and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no frequent vision. At that time, Eli, whose sight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his own place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. What a place to grow up in the presence of the ark. Verse four, the Lord called out, the Lord called Samuel and Samuel said, here I am. And he ran to Eli. Here I am. You called me. But he said, I did not call you. Go and lie down. And so he went and lay down. And then the Lord called again, Samuel and Samuel rose and he went to Eli and said, here I am for you called me. But he said, I did not call you, my son lie down again. Samuel did not know yet the Lord or the word of the Lord had not yet come and been revealed to him. The Lord called to Samuel again the third time and he rose and he went to Eli and he said, here I am, you called me. And Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore, Eli said to Samuel, go lie down. And if he calls you, you shall say, speak Lord, for your servant hears. So Samuel went out. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood, calling as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, speak, for your servant hears. And the Lord said to Samuel, behold, I am about to do a thing in Israel at which the two ears of everyone who hears it will tingle. On that day, I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from the beginning to the end. I will declare to him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God and he did not restrain them. Therefore, I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. Verse 15, and Samuel lay until morning. Then he opened the doors to the house of the Lord. Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli, but Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. And he said, here I am. Eli said, what is it that he told you do not hide it from me. May God do so to you and more also if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. And Eli said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. And Samuel grew and the Lord was with him. 
and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, from north to south, all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was established as a prophet of the Lord. And the Lord appeared again at Shiloh. And the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. And the word of Samuel came to all Israel. This is the word of the Lord. Father in heaven, we ask that you would speak to us for our ears to hear. And that out of this sordid story, in which yet we see you work, that you would speak in this age and that you would build your church and that you would work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. There are apt to be corrupt leaders in every place where there is any kind of a hierarchy of authority, whether it be government or whether it be business or public institutions or homes and the church as well. If you have lived very long, it's not very hard for you to associate names and faces with these scenarios which are to follow. A government elected official who uses his place, his position of influence to line his own pockets or the pockets of his own family members with lots of cash. Not caring for the people, but using his office for personal gain. It would not be uncommon to associate names, even faces, with business leaders, even investment fund managers who have made off with millions upon millions, maybe even billions of money embezzled or stolen from other people who are now left bankrupt because of their corruption or officers of the law who are in a position to protect people who are actually committing atrocities against people or even taking bribes so that they could turn a blind eye and that crime that they should stop is able to continue even though they are the officers of the law or even child care workers who betray the trust of parents who entrust their children into their hands. Oh. And whatever places we need authority, and we do need authorities, but in every place where we need authority, and where God has even appointed authority, it is very likely also that we will find that there are times at least when corruption creeps in to those offices of authority. And just so that you know where I'm going with this message, let me just state clearly, the same can be true in the church of Jesus Christ. Sadly, the same thing that we're saying and we're seeing in the world is equally true, maybe even equally prevalent in the very church of God. And to feign otherwise would be foolish and, in fact, dangerous. Here today, we've read about it in the Old Testament. We could have just as well read about it in the New Testament. Corruption of leaders in the New Testament. We're already seeing that in the first few decades of the New Testament. Or we could have read it from the newspapers of the last year. Today, or this year, we have in the Roman church, in the Protestant church, in the higher echelons of the hierarchies of the church, all the way down to the local and congregational level, we have stories that come up and they come to our ears and they burn in our ears of corruption that has come into the very house of God. And this morning we're asking, what does God say about that? What does God do about that? And what does all of that have to do with you and with me. This is what God is talking about here in this passage, and therefore this is what we're talking about as well. Today, our example is one of many examples that has been taken from the Old Testament church. We're looking at the Old Testament church. We're looking at this situation of Eli, who was the high priest, the first high priest, and then his two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. Those are his priests under him as the high priest. And we know here that they were fully ordained. These men were fully recognized by the people of God. They are, in fact, fully the personal representatives of the God of Israel to his people. 
And so these are the ones that God has in fact set over the people of God. And yet we know that they are also fully corrupt and notoriously so. This was evident in the eyes of the priests. It's evident in the eyes of Eli. It was present to the eyes of all the people that came to the temple. And it was also evident, of course, to God himself. And that brings us to the very first thing that we learn here about God as he looks on these God, looks down on these godless leaders, and that is that God, though seemingly silent, sees. God, though seemingly silent, in fact, sees. What does God see here? Well, he doesn't just see the immediate moments, the immediate things that we read, but he sees everything that's been going on for 300 years building up to this. And so I'll remind you here that this is the last chapter, you might say, in that era of the judges, when the judges ruled. And, and during that time, the tagline that was attached to all of those years was, and everyone did what was right in their own eyes. In other words, they didn't fear God. They did whatever was right in their own eyes. And God's been seeing that for 300 years, the apostasy at the grassroots level of all of his people. And so he's watched over these 300 years how his people begin just kind of edging a little bit away, um, finding their comforts in other things, and then turning away from him. They forget him. They... They actually stray away from the things of God. They're involved in immoralities. And God begins to remove in this cyclic way again and again and again and again. This is repeated. God begins to remove his favor, remove his blessing even from his own people until they come down to the point where they are harassed and they're helpless and, and their um, marauders come into their country and they wipe out their crops and steal and put them under foreign rule. And then they eventually get down to the point where life is so bad that they cry out. They just pour out their hearts to God again after all these years. Oh, God, please come and save us. And God hears their prayers. And he begins to show favor to them again. And he sends them a judge, some kind of a godly leader, often a godly, not even always a godly leader. He sends someone and they are rescued from their dire situation. But then again, in this cycle that takes place again and again, over 300 years the people will just fall back in. They, everything's going well now. They don't need the Lord. And so they start leaning away and departing from the Lord. And then things get very, very, very bad again. And he calls out and they cry out to God and he hears their prayers again. So God has been observing carefully this all too often repeated cycle. And it's in this Old Testament era apostasy that God is now in this passage looking down at Eli and at Hophni and at Phinehas, people who ought to be leading God's people back to him who are in fact abusive, godless, and flagrantly immoral in their so-called Ministries. In short, their ministry is a sham, and God calls it that, only worse, in chapter 3, verse 13. He calls it blasphemy. You're carrying on, and you're doing all these things. You're performing these half duties in my sight, and yet it's all a sham. You're doing these things in my name, but doing them for your own prosperity and your own good. By the way... Whenever you see things that are going wrong, whenever you see, for example, godless leaders making immoral laws and godless churches approving of immorality, whenever you see that, don't conclude that God doesn't see. Don't think that when vast immorality is going on in the world and in the church that God doesn't see. Don't think that God doesn't see you because God does see you. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13, the writer of Hebrews just declares it this simply. He says, nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything 
is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him with whom we have to do. And so what this is saying is that God sees everything. He sees the good. He sees the bad. He sees the ugly. He sees everything. There is nothing that is hidden from his sight. And so whether it's activities that are hidden to the human eye up in the high echelons of society or up in the upper reaches of banks of authority or all the way down to the lowest and commonest rank and file member of society or even below don't ever think that just because God is temporarily silent about something that God doesn't see, because God does see. God does see. Nothing is hidden from his sight. Now, it does say here that God in those days was mostly silent. It says God in those days was mostly silent. That's chapter 3, verse 1. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. That means God isn't doing too much in dealing with his people. God isn't coming after them every day. God isn't coming after them and getting in their faces again and again and again. The best explanation for that statement, I think, is found in this. As long as God's people during this period of time were bent on doing whatever was right in their own eyes, Apparently, regardless of what God says to them again and again and again, God has come to a point now where he's simply remaining silent. He's not wasting his time with people who are putting their fingers in their ears and not listening to him at all. He's become silent, it says, and the word of the Lord was rare in those days. And this can sometimes be true of us too. This can sometimes, not always, this can sometimes be true of us. The reason sometimes, sometimes, let me say that again, just sometimes. The reason sometimes that God is silent to you could even be that he's told you and he's told you and he's told you again and you're just not listening. And when that's the case, if that's the case, be aware of what's going on because the silence of God in that case, in that case, in the case where a person is pushing away God and feels the silence of God, the silence of God could actually be the precursor for his irrevocable judgment coming down. Just as his silence here with Hophni and Phineas and Eli is not an indication that God doesn't see or God doesn't care, but just that his irrevocable judgment is coming. And that brings us to a second question, which is, what does God do on account of what he sees? What does God do on account of what he sees taking place? Well, he does two or three things in response to this scandalous, blasphemous iniquity of his priesthood. And the first is something that actually began two or three decades before, two or three decades before this whole thing blew up. God had begun a work even before people were crying out for the need of it. And this began, as we saw last week, when a woman named Hannah married a man named Elkanah and they began to want to have children, and they couldn't have children. And as we said last, year, last time together, that maybe that went on for five years or even ten years. And you, and you, could just, you, you just see the, the torment and the difficulty, the pining for children that this couple had during that five or ten years, let's say. And then Elkanah, the husband, decided apparently to marry again, and he marries Penina, and Penina begins to have child after child after child after child, and all the while still, for maybe another, what, maybe another five or ten years, you find her pining now because she's being compared to this so, so productive wife. And then eventually, as we saw last week, God has mercy on this woman. She cries out, doesn't she? 
She pours out her heart to God. Oh, God, please give me a son. If you do, I will take him and turn him right back to you. And I want him to serve you all the days of his life. God answers that prayer. And then that little boy is born. And here is this little boy as we read our scripture this morning. Here's that little boy. He's in the uh, temple. And he's wearing his little ephod that his mother made him. And every year that ephod gets a little bigger with the boy. It's a beautiful thing to think of that little, more innocent child. Even there where all this corruption is going on. And he's going about serving the Lord in his innocent little way. Well, that was 30 years ago that that all began. And so when we're seeing this, we need to recognize, you know, God was doing something all that time. Let's put yourself in this place of a worshiper who's going to the tabernacle at that time to offer your, your sheep or your goat or your bull or whatever. And you're bringing your sacrifice in. It's all slaughtered up and, and the parts are going out and you're seeing the priests are taking the part that belongs to God. Or maybe you're seeing the you know, priest goes over and he pinches some babe who's working there in the, in the, in the temple. And you're recognizing what in the world is going going on here? Flagrant immorality in the house of God. I got to tell this to Eli. You go to Eli and Eli, Eli rolls his eye. Now I can't change anything. I can't do anything. And you could go away from that place and you could be saying, God, don't you see what's happening right here in your tabernacle? Don't you see this? Why aren't you doing anything? The reality though is this. God's been working for 30 years, and that little boy in the ephod is the next dynasty of spiritual life in this country coming up, even in this unlikely place in Eli's presence. And so the reason I'm saying this is because it's probable that we face circumstances that we would look at and we would be prone to do the very same thing and say, God, how come you aren't doing anything? I know you see. Why aren't you doing anything? And it just may be that even though you can't see that God's been working for three years or even for 30 years, and you just haven't realized what God yet is doing. So a big part of trusting God actually is it requires our recognizing that we don't see everything that God is doing. We can't see. We never will be able to see all that God is doing. And we have to wait and perhaps even in this life never see what it is that God is doing in the situations that cause us so much turmoil. So that's the first thing that God is doing. He's working behind the scenes here. Even when he's silent, he's working behind the scenes. He is doing something. And there's a second thing that God is doing here. And that is he's speaking certainly. And God is speaking irrevocably here. And the first place that we see this is in the first thing that God says to Eli through the prophet He's declaring a catastrophic judgment that will come on the whole house of Eli. And so he says, this is chapter 2, verse 33 to Eli, through the prophet, he says, All the descendants of your house, save one, shall die by the sword of men. And then in chapter 3, verse 14, a similar thing, only worse. And all the iniquity of your house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. That is, has got to be the worst thing that anyone could ever hear from the voice of God or from his prophet. But the iniquity of your house shall not be atoned for by sacrifice or offering forever. And at this point, in the moment God spoke these things, it might seem like, well, God said that, but nothing happened. God said that, but it was just words. God's just saying, right? And maybe after a week or a month or a year goes by, 
Eli would even begin to think again, ha, huh, well, I'm glad that's over. God was just saying, it wasn't really that he was saying anything important. He just, God was just blowing off steam. Not so. Because what God says, he always does without exception. What God says, he does. And so we see, just looking ahead, if you just turn the chapter over to chapter 4, you'll see that Eli and Hophni and Phinehas are dead in a single day. <laughs> that the, the axe of God begins to fall. And the axe of God falls again in chapter 22, which you probably haven't reached yet if you're reading along with our reading schedule. But in, in, in chapter 22, 85 of Eli's descendants who wear the ephod, who are priests. This is two or three generations hence. Two or three generations down. 85 of them are killed by the sword in one day. And only one is left according to the prophecy of God. Which is to say, God's words and God's declarations are not just words. They always come to be. What God has said, he indeed will do. They're absolute. That's the nature of God's words. When he speaks, creation comes into being. And when he says, this will happen, it will happen. Speaking of God speaking, there is a second thing here that God says. The first thing we saw was an irrevocable judgment. The second is an irrevocable blessing. An irrevocable blessing of God that cannot be changed. This will come to pass. And we're reading here in chapter 2, verse 35, following the promise of judgment on Eli's house, the prophet continues and he says, and I will raise up for God. God is saying through the prophet, and I will raise up for myself a faithful priest who shall do according to all to, who, who shall do according to what is in my heart and in my mind and I will build a sure house for him forever that's a promise that's a promise of blessing now there's a little uncertainty about who is he speaking of when he says I will raise up a faithful priest is he speaking about Samuel is he speaking about the boy that was born by special circumstances and is over there in the little ephod? Is he speaking about that boy? Certainly, if he is, that would be true. Samuel is raised up and he does what God wants and he listens to what God says and he carries it out and he becomes a spiritual leader who coalesces a spiritual life in Israel after all of these years. Or could it be that he's speaking of Zadok, that he's saying, and I will raise up for myself a faithful high priest, Zadok. And Zadok is the high priest who's appointed after those 85 are cut off. And over the, when that last one also is taken out, Zadok is the priest that is made priest after that time. Could it be that God is speaking of that? That he's saying, I will raise up as a faithful priest, Zadok, and he will do. He will be a dynasty of priests to the house of David. Could it be that that is what it's speaking of? Or could it be that this is messianic? That when God's prophet is speaking, that he's saying, and I will raise up for myself a faithful high priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. I will raise up my son and he will be the king, and he will be the priest, and he will be the prophet, priest, and king, and he will do what I have in my mind, and I will build a sure house for him. It could be that that's it. It could be that he's saying basically what Jesus is saying, and I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Well, it could be all three. It could be that in God's knowledge of all things, that that prophet even has all three of those in mind. And he's doing all three at the same time. But the point is the same. Whatever God says that he will do, he will do. Whatever God says that he will do, he will do. You can bank on it. His words are more solid than gold, right? They're absolute. When God says it, whether it's blessing or whether it's judgment, God will do it. God will do it. 
Isn't it good to be a blood-bought child of God then? Isn't it good that every promise that God makes to all of his people is yes and amen for those who are in Christ? That in Christ, our sins can be paid for by Christ and his righteous sacrifice for us imputes the righteousness of Christ to us so that when God sees us, he rewards us and we have an inheritance even, as Ephesians said, in the heavenly places. And it's not an inheritance that we've earned, but the inheritance that Christ has earned. Could it be that it's really true that God has blessed us in every, with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places? God said it. That day will come. That day will come soon. And we will see it with our own eyes. Why? How can I say that? Because God said it. It's true. He chose us from before the foundations of the world were laid. He chose us to be adopted as his sons and daughters. He's given us redemption, the forgiveness of sins. This is all Ephesians chapter 1. And he's given us an inheritance in heaven that will never perish, spoil, or fade. God said that, blood-bought saint, and it will be. It will be. We can trust in God. He does what he says. And thirdly, in the way of application here, what does this have to do with all of us? These are some applications that just kind of fall in from the side here. And so I want to look at three applications of this just quickly in closing. The first is, take notice from 1 Samuel how important godly spiritual leadership is. Take notice here. Boy, when people are leading God's people who are corrupt, all the people will languish. And that's true whether it's in a church or in a home. It's true in an office when you have godly leadership or in a nation when you have godly leadership. The people are happy. There's harmony. There's humility and there's wisdom. And where people are not godly, there is a languishing. There's selfishness. There's pride and impulse and chaos rules. And so with that in mind, I want to just say this to every Christian here. I want to say this. Be a godly leader wherever you are. Be a godly mother. Be a godly father. Be a godly peer in your peer group. Be a godly person in your workplace. Set an example. Support godly leaders as well. When you see godly leaders, give your support. Pull in behind them, realizing, of course, that ultimately there is only one who will never disappoint. Pastor Chuck will disappoint you. I can guarantee you one time or another, maybe many times, Pastor Chuck will disappoint you. The elders of this church will periodically not do what you think that they should do, what, they, what you need them to do. Every man will fail. Every woman will fail, right? And so our only trust ultimately can be in God. But support your godly leaders. Secondly, I just want to address a concern that almost always comes from married couples who are thinking about having children. They ask a question something like this. With the world that we live in, when I look around, I ask myself, do I really want to bring kids into this world, right? And this is not a new question. I remember from, I wasn't even born in 1956, but I remember my parents talking about how in 1956, Nikita Khrushchev took it off his shoe and in front of all the Western ambassadors, he smashed his shoe down on the podium in wrath and he said to the Western leaders, he said, we will bury you. And that was the, you know, kind of the first call of the Cold War. And that sent shivers through my parents. And they were asking, and they were married in 1956 in July. And that happened in, I think, October 14th of that same year. And they began asking themselves, do we really want to bring children into this world? In every generation since, and probably some before that too, right? There's been the same kind of thing that's been said. 
in the 60s and in the 70s. It may have been the Cold War or the post-hippie drug culture or the 80s or the 90s, the AIDS epidemic and the sexual revolution. If you haven't figured out what it is in the 21st century, I'm not going to tell you. But there are plenty of reasons that people are wondering, oh, should I bring children into this world? And here's the answer. Psalm 127 says, children are a blessing from the Lord. And the world, by the way, needs more of those blessings, not less. The world needs more godly children to be raised up, not less. And just as out of darkness, God brought reformation and light by a little boy in an ephod. So God typically in every generation brings reformation and light through children who are born into the world to be the leaders in the next generation. And so from that, I would say, bring them into the world and spend all of your energies on this, training them up to be men and women of God who will be great instruments in the master's hands to bring godly leadership in the dark ages that are ahead of us. And then lastly, just quickly, I want to commend to you the simple stance, the humble stance of young, of young Samuel. And this is what made all the difference in Samuel. And this is what will make all the difference in your life also. His stance was this. His stance was this. Speak, Lord, for your servant listens. Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. Speak, Lord, for your servant hears. That makes a difference. Father in heaven, thank you on this Sunday of not so good amplification for speaking to us nonetheless. And we ask that what we have heard and what you are saying specifically to us, that this would come home to us and that we would appreciate you and trust you and look to you and cry out to you and be quietly humble before you. Speak to us, Lord, as we listen. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our hymn of the month, uh, a couple of months ago, is this last hymn, our hymn of response today. I want to ask you to stand together, and we'll sing together, I love thy kingdom, Lord, the house of thine abode.
and with great joy to the only God, our Savior, be glory and majesty and power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen.